Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Climate Confident Podcast. My name is Tom Raftery, and with me on the show today, I have my special guest, Victor. Victor, welcome to the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you for having me here. Yes, I'm Victor Meyer. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Glice. We produce eco-friendly zero energy ice canting rinks around the globe. <laughs> okay, nice. So Glice is a company based out of Switzerland, I think, and yes. you're producing zero energy, environmentally friendly ice rinks. Tell me a little bit, first of all, Victor, about your origin story. You know, how did you come up with the idea of creating a company to do ice skating on zero energy, et cetera? You know, where did that all come from? Well, I always joke that uh, I took a shower and suddenly had that in, in front of my eyes, you know, ice skating you know, <laughs> with zero energy. No, it was not like that. It was a pure story of uh, serendipity. And my interest or my passion to, to kind of uh, take care of the planet started very young when I was a kid. I remember I was playing always in the woods and there was the Chernobyl accident in, I think, 1986. Yeah. And we were not allowed to go out and play outside for like three weeks. There I realized, oh my God, it's we humans. We can destroy the whole planet if we want to. From then on, I knew if one day I build something, I do something, I dedicate myself to something, that then it will be something to improve the world, especially climate change, animal protection, nature protection. So that was, that was the base. And I grew up in an entrepreneur family. My, my, my parents were entrepreneurs, so I had that a bit in, in every lunch table. We talked mm -hmm. about entrepreneurship. <laughs> Later, when I went to, to school, actually, I thought I want to become a diplomat because I've seen these big climate conferences and stuff and thought maybe that's a way I can contribute. And so mm -hmm. I went to diplomacy training. And when I was almost finished, I realized the diplomacy uh, career is very formal, it's very slow, and mm -hmm. I, I, I could feel that I have like an entrepreneurial gene in myself. And I worked different jobs in business, marketing, and so on. And one day I was working for uh, Phonak, that's, that's a hearing aid company. I was in the global sales, and I was, uh, you know, it was, was an interesting job, but it was very corporate. I was sitting in a cubicle. <laughs> and the guy next to me has been there already for 20 years. And I already saw myself how I end up in that cubicle <laughs> in 20 years. And so I started to look around uh, and uh, for ideas and stuff. And so one day I watched BBC. There was a show about uh, in inventors. And there was this short part of, of a guy. Uh, his name is Tony. And he developed this material which looks like ice. It feels like ice, but it's not ice. And so when I saw that, I immediately Googled him. I found his contact number and then I contacted him and said, hey, that's a really cool innovation, right? And uh, because it combined for me, it's saving the planet, it's saving CO2 and it's sport. And I also liked sport. So for me, it was like, well, that's it. And we immediately clicked. I, I, I skated on, on the surface. I, I loved it. I had a few ideas because I was uh, working all over Europe. I was working in the US and had a lot of different business experience. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, that was the, the starting point. And so we set up uh, the company in, in Switzerland. He took care of innovation, production, and so on. And I took care of marketing, sales, the, like the business functions. And that's how it all started. That's very cool, Victor. So how do you make low energy, environmentally friendly ice? So going back to the, the, the refrigerated ice, you know, like the, the reason uh, why my, my business partner started with that product is that uh, regular refrigerated ice uses a lot of energy and water. So mm -hmm. to, to just to have an idea, one, one square meter of, of regular refrigerated ice used the same amount of energy and water like an average household. So if you have an Olympic size rink, that's 1,800 homes, right? Wow. And it's huge. It's insane. It's just for a sport, for leisure, right? The product, the glass, it's panels, two by one meter, and they are 20 millimeters thick. It's made of high-grade polymers. 
with different additives like silicon and so on. And it's pressed in a machine very slowly with high heat pressure, high heat. And that creates this kind of product, which is very low friction. And you can use normally bladed skates made of steel and you can perfectly ice skate on it. And we actually did biometric tests with universities and stuff and the movement, everything is, is identical to, to the conventional ice. Wow. And do the metal skates not scratch the surface of it? So th there is a little bit of scratching, but actually we, we soon realized that the more the surface is a little bit scratched, but we talk about micro scratches, the better it glides. So it even improves the, uh, the, the gliding, but it's always evenly scratched, even after one hour of usage, but doesn't influence the, the sustainability of the product. Actually, our product lost 20 to 30 years. After 15 years, you can flip it over and you have a brand new ice skating. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Uh, what happens after the 20 to 30 years then? Do you just buy a new series of tiles and retile? Start over? Exactly. So, so after some time, but also what can be is that our technology progress goes so fast that someone maybe wants to get the latest version. And we already done pay uh, buyback and we sold it to clients you know, who couldn't afford the new one. So that can happen. A second uh, possibility is recycling. So we can produce a uh, different kind of polymers with it. With it. And the third uh, one is we have an alliance with Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. And we had some damaged panels and they built mm -hmm. refugee homes for Ukrainians with our ice panels. Oh, so well. that's the third option. But it's our panels almost undestructible. So that use makes sense or... or as I said, recycling is also possible. Okay. And in your view, how crucial is innovation in tackling climate change? You know, how does GLICE fit into the larger picture of sustainability solutions? You know, I read once a study and I don't remember the details, but around 70 or 80% of humans on this earth, they all agree, hey, we have to tackle climate change. Mm. But the people who say they're ready to completely change their life, it's right, 4% or so. The only way we can keep the standard of living of people and their leisure activities while fighting climate change is through innovation. What we do now, do it without CO2 emission. What we do now, without toxins. What we do now, without water and so on. So it's only innovation which can solve that problem. Okay. And you, you talked earlier as well about the amount of energy that a refrigerated ice rink uses. One square meter is the equivalent of a typical home was the, the figure you used, if I remember correctly. What about water? Because obviously typical ice rinks are using a lot of water as well, no? So the, the typical ice rink, obviously they, they need a lot of water at the beginning. But then mm -hmm. also when you see their surfacing machine, which removes water and then you add water again, and they actually use hot water to make that. So you have energy again to put it. So there is high uh, water usage and consumption for regular ice rink. And it, it doesn't stop there. If you have an indoor ice rink, humidity is uh, poison for an ice rink. So you have to have oh. huge air condition system. So they use energy again and wow. so on. So, so it's a never ending story to freeze uh, an ice rink. And where we come in, we can put an ice rink in any place, indoor, outdoor, doesn't matter. Like in Europe nowadays, uh, even the, the winters are much warmer because of global mm. warming. And it's actually mm. hard to freeze an ice rink outdoors, even in Scandinavia. So that's why we have sold our rinks in over 100 countries. Obviously, wow. we also have the, the tropical countries. They cannot afford to have uh, ice. But we also mm. sell, uh, sold at least three ice rinks to Iceland. Even if they uh, need our solution, they cannot use natural uh, ice anymore because it's not really getting 100% cold uh, every winter. So you see, we really have global warming and we need to do something about it. Okay. And who are typical customers? Is it sporting organizations? Is it municipalities? Is it hotels? You know, who is it hotels? You know, who, 
who normally who who wakes up one morning and says, I think I'll buy an ice rink today? <laughs> <laughs> well, you nailed it with, with the examples. I, I would say the, the biggest industry we are serving are municipalities. So so they want to have one for, you know, like a permanent one or maybe for the Christmas holidays and so on. And, and then also sports clubs, hockey teams, the NHL just bought the rink. They, they want to promote ice hockey around uh, North America. And mm-hmm. we are planning uh, several rinks with, with them. Then, as we also perfectly said, hotels, you know, mostly for holiday seasons, shopping mall. But we also have a lot of private people that they build a small glass rink at home for practice. Oh. You know, this rule, 10,000 hours to become a champion or a master in any, anything. So mm. the, the kids who want to be an NHL star, they need to, to practice daily. And with a glass rink at home in the basement or in the garden, they can practice every day. But it doesn't stop there. Like These are the obvious ones or like the museums, zoos. Any venue where they want to attract people or give them some entertainment. But we also have a lot of movie sets. When, whenever there's an ice rink, you know, they, they, they set up a glass rink in a studio, make, a, make it look like a pond or something. We also have all major players in the car industry because cars need to be tested for ski testing, for behavior yeah, yeah. on ice. And right. they usually took the cars up to Finland on frozen ice in December to do mm-hmm. all the testing, super expensive. Again, a lot of pollution. Now they can have their glass rink at Honda in Japan or in Germany at Volkswagen or, or, or BMW and do the testing every day, all year round and like that. Honestly, we get around 50 requests for proposal every day. And wow. sometimes it's very interesting to see what shows up because anything is possible. You know, we put an ice rink on top of a skyscraper in, in Dubai and so on. So everything is possible. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. And as you said, you're in over a hundred countries now, which is incredible. What were some of the challenges you faced in scaling globally? And how did you maintain your commitment to sustainability throughout the process? So at the beginning, honestly, our product was too good to be true. So, <laughs> so yeah, so no one could believe it. So, so that was, was almost the, the first hurdle. The second right. hurdle was that people, it's the mindset. And I, I heard that in other innovations, you know, like it's often it's the people's mindset uh, to change, which is more challenging than the, than the technology itself. Mm. And at the beginning, where I remember I sent an email to a hockey player and he responded, never, ever will I skate on something which is not ice or, you know, like (laughs) just his reaction. And this was very hard at the beginning. And uh, also every client, they came with a list, you know, like with a list of questions. Can you do that? And so it was really very hard to do sell at the beginning. What helped us is uh, at the very beginning, and there was an ex-NHL player in Canada He heard about us. He asked for like a sample. We sent him a sample. He liked it. And he set up several hockey training centers all over North America. And that kind of got traction. And then we were slowly in uh, some some news or like hockey related uh, magazines and stuff. And that just uh, created uh, a bit of the traction. And um, so that was the, the part, you know, how we slowly get out of it nowadays. People uh, order rinks and they don't come testing. They 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 order big, very big rinks just over the phone and and we ship it out to them and and so it completely changed uh, in the meantime. Wow. Yeah. And, and and what about the installation process? Is it something that you can self assemble? Because if you're just shipping it out to them, is it a bit like a, an IKEA flat pack that you <laughs> that you put together? It, it is indeed. Uh, yeah, it's it's like IKEA. So all the Private clients, they they get it shipped. They the, the father and son they install it together and then they skate on it. So it's it's that easy. For yeah. the commercial um, solutions, we not only sell the ice, we sell the full business package, meaning like the the boards, the skates, the skate sharpening machine, the the shelves, so everything. And there is a cleaning process, which is 
on one side very easy, but you need to do it consistently, right? And so right. we provide uh, some supervision, some training. We have a GLICE Academy where the operators can get certified in half an hour. So they go through a certification course. And like that, we ensure that everyone is well-trained and our rinks are perfectly managed and, and like that. But it's, it's really straightforward. In bigger countries like US, we normally ship the rink they install themselves and we are there, you know, on, on support line if they need any help, but they normally mm -hmm. manage. And some countries, smaller countries, it's uh, the local partner who sets it up and supervises the installation. And apart from the water and the energy savings that we talked about already, are there other benefits that users might not immediately think of? There are. For example, if, if you go ice skate or... On a, on a regular ice rink and you fall down, it's it's either extremely hard because ice is very hard. Uh, ours yeah. is more shock absorbing, so we have much less accidents. Second, if you fall on, on regular ice, unless it's perfectly frozen and, and good quality ice, it's, it's often a bit wet, so you get mm. wet close. Ours is dry, so these are the main ones. The, another one is on our ice, you immediately feel more safe and confident. It's easier to learn because on the regular ice, you immediately feel it's so hard. If I fall here and then people are scared and tense and on the glass, they, they feel a bit more confident to learn faster. Oh, nice, nice, nice. And with climate change affecting natural ice availability, as you've re referred to already, how do you see the future of ice sports evolving? The future of ice sports obviously is, is is kind of in danger. Like every every year we hear and read in the media uh, that ice rinks are closing. First, it's on the economic side because it's very expensive with higher energy prices to run an ice rink. Mm -hmm. And then it's the environmental reason that you, know, you cannot justify to freeze water just for leisure. So... This is coming. And then what we discussed before is that in almost every country now, the winters are so warm that you cannot really sustain a refrigerated rink outdoors. So there we come in as well. And we could really feel over the last few years, every year, the demand gets higher for our rinks. Okay. What about something like the Winter Olympics? Because I know... That obviously happens every four years. Do you see a role for yourselves in that, given the increasing demand for sustainability around the Olympics? So for the Olympics, it, the rinks are homologated. So, so there are rules that an Olympic Games, for example, needs to happen on refrigerated ice. Maybe somewhere in the future, they will change the, these rules, right? But right now, mm -hmm. that's a fact. I don't expect that in the next two Winter Olympics, they will actually perform the figure skating or so on glice. What we know for a fact is that in preparation, the athletes use glice for training. And also sometimes we have delivered our glice rink for the preparation area. If, if next to the ice rink, they want to warm up and they use our product, but actual competition that's for Olympics, I, I don't see it uh, right now, but who knows in, in a few years. It's like in soccer, right? You have the artificial grass and the natural grass, and maybe the world championship is still on natural grass. And here's this kind of similar evolution. Right. Okay. And you talked earlier about innovation as well, and it's obviously important for creating glyce, but do you use innovative practices in your management and business practices as well, or is it just for creating the glyce product? I would say in glass, the innovation, it's, it's in our DNA. And, and actually, we have three values in glass. Mm -hmm. One is like, you know, dedication, work hard. One is uh, team spirit to really always work together. And the third one is open, innovative mind. So whatever we do, always be open. If, if you get the feedback, don't be defensive, be open <laughs> to learn and, and progress. And I think this this mindset is key for, for us. And we apply that. So everything we do, we ask ourselves, how could we do it different, right? And we we are a company long before COVID. We, we had, 
you know, open schedules, uh, no office, so ev everyone could work from anywhere they want. We didn't define hours or, or vacations, so everyone had their clear responsibilities mm -hmm. and, and goals. And as long as you manage that and with a very strong culture, we feel actually people work harder than in a regular company where they, you know, have uh, presence and stuff. And we almost need to say, hey, maybe it's time you take some vacation. So it's <laughs> almost the, the opposite. What advice would you give to other entrepreneurs looking to make a positive environmental impact through innovation? I, I would say, you know, like uh, find something you really care about. And then sometimes you just need to connect the dot. You need to meet other people. You always find people who know something much better than you do and find them. I, I can mm. say, for example, in Gleis, every year we try to make the Gleis even better, gliding better and so on. And, and I, I try to find the specific scientists for this part of the product, this attribute. And you always find that people are normally very, very helpful and they're willing to help. And if they are passionate about your project, they come and, and help. So just be open, ask always good questions and mm -hmm. find people who can help you to the next step. And I, I don't know if that sounds like a clear formula, but it's just, you know, openness and that, that will bring you to the, to the solution. Sure. And how can local communities and organizations get involved with Glyce? Or do you have initiatives to make your technology available to underrepresented or underserved areas? Uh, yes, we, we've done actually uh, a number of, of projects uh, around the world. So sometimes we get a request, hey, we, our community in Africa or in Mexico, or so we never ice skated. And <laughs> there was a, a child, her dream, she was t terminally ill, but her dream was to ice skate at home. So th there were always, you know, these kind of projects coming to us. And we always tried to encourage that and find a uh, a solution to make that happen. Maybe sometimes ourselves, maybe to get with a sponsor and ourselves as well as sponsors. And I, I tell you, there's nothing more beautiful than going to these uh, communities and setting up a, an ice rink mm -hmm. and seeing the eyes of all the kids who have never seen an ice rink and then they can go on it and you help them do the first steps. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's really amazing. Wow, yeah, lovely. And what are your goals for the future of, of GLICE? How do you envision your technology contributing to sustainability efforts on a global scale? So right now, there are still a ton of refrigerated ice rinks around the world. And, mm. and uh, you know, there are different numbers between 12,000 and, and 20,000 uh, refrigerated ice rinks. And Olympics aside, and maybe the Stanley Cup uh, of the NHL or so, a lot of these rinks, they, they would work perfectly with our sustainable solution. So we, we want to keep uh, converting, helping uh, convert these, these rinks to, to glass. Uh, obviously, we want to keep uh, evolving our technology. Also, we are applying more and more our technology to other sports. For example, the Swiss pop team is now training for the Olympics on glass. Right. And so on. So, so there are other sports we can apply it and just to grow the global community. What we also try to do is that we have a program called Skate for the Planet, where we mm. bring school classes to an ice rink. We do some sustainability awareness workshops and, and games with them. And then they go ice skating. And normally, you know, like, like ecological innovation, oftentimes it's not very visible. It's maybe a pump uh, below the street and you don't mm -hmm. see the innovation, but a glass rink is a very visible uh, innovation and they can see with their eyes, wow, someone used their brain to save <laughs> tons of energy. And another thing we are we're already doing now is obviously when we produce our glass panels, they, mm -hmm. they, they use CO2 or, or energy, although very limited. For every panel we produce, we plant a tree with another organization. And so our production, energy expenditure, our transport, travel, it's all compensated. Then. And uh, like that, as a whole, we can be a fully net zero uh, company. Okay. And I didn't ask at the start, where did the name Gleis come from? 
And that's a very good question. I actually went skiing with a friend and I told him about this idea and we were like brainstorming and he asked me, so how is that? And so on. And I said, gliding and so on. And so we ended up in gliding and ice and that's how the name was, was born. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Left field question. If you could have any celebrity or fictional character, alive or dead, as a spokesperson for Gleis, who would it be and why? Spontaneously, just think about Arnold Schwarzenegger, because he's very dedicated to climate change. And actually, mm -hmm. he was once standing on a Gleis rink. I met him and, okay. and he loved it. They asked me a lot of questions. And at the end, he asked me for my business card and because I was on a trade show. And already gave away all my business cards. I had <laughs> I had to scribble on a flyer my phone number, and I gave it to him. And he said, "I'll call you back." But <laughs> unfortunately, he never called me back. So maybe one day he will remember and and uh, okay. contact me. Interesting. I was expecting you to say Elsa from Frozen, but Schwarzenegger exactly. is a better answer. Yeah. <laughs> cool, lovely. Super. We're coming towards the end of the podcast now, Victor. Is there any question I didn't ask that you wish I had or any aspect of this we haven't talked about that you think it's important for people to be aware of? So when we started this, we, we immediately realized that it's Glyce is almost like a franchise. And so we set up licensed partners in all the countries. To, okay. to, to sell glass and, and so on. And so I was traveling from the beginning, actually nonstop. The first eight years I was traveling. And at the very beginning, our budget was so limited that I stayed in youth hostels. And <laughs> I remember sometimes I was like talking with my business partner, you know, about stuff. And he asked, why are you whispering? And I said, yeah, because there are other people sleeping next to me. So... <laughs> That's that. These are the humble beginnings. That's how we built uh, our little empire of uh, ice skating. But we, we have very fond memory, you know, of 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 these nice. starting days. <laughs> Super, Victor. If people would like to know more about yourself or any of the things we discussed in the podcast today, where would you have me direct them? Either on our website, it's gliserink.com, and also if you want. Someone wants to follow me. I, I do a regular posts on LinkedIn. So it's LinkedIn slash Victor Meyer, Victor with a K, Meyer with a I like Italy. So there you can find me. No, I'll, I'll put those links in the show notes as well, Victor, so people can find them there too. Super. Victor, that's been really interesting. Thanks a million for coming on the podcast today. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. <laughs>